Good morning. Today on Spotlight, a detailed trip inside the restoration of Detroit's historic Michigan Central Station. No one knows that century-old building better than Angela Wyrembelski, the project preservation architect and senior associate at Quinn Evans Architectural Firm. Her journey in bringing that Corktown Depot back to life for the Ford Motor Company is fascinating. And later on our Sunday morning program, remembering two Detroit legends. It's Sunday, June the 16th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. Angela Wyrenbowski, thank you so much for coming and being a part of Spotlight today. I, I, I've been dying to talk to you. Uh, several months ago, you spoke in front of the Historical Society of Michigan at their local history conference. I think there were about 300 people in the room, and I remember them giving you a standing ovation at the <laughs> end of it. So, uh, so we're going to work on standing ovation number two here and want to give a shout out to Erica McDowell over at the Historical Society who put us in contact. So thanks for coming in. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right, I want to take you back. Everybody's seen all these fabulous pictures of the restoration of Michigan Central Station, but you go back to the beginning of this <laughs> six year process. Can you recall the first time you walked in and saw it and what your reaction was? Yes, I remember it very vividly. One, because it was very cold. It was in February, we walked Ooh. in uh, you could just feel the chill in the building. Um, there was snow on the ground. We literally ice skated through one of the, <laughs> the <laughs> areas. Not a um, good sign. <laughs> uh, but we were taken aback by how much of the history and, uh, and uh, details that were left still present. Mm -hmm. And we, we could see right away that there, there was stuff to save. There and was never doubt in your mind that this building <laughs> could be saved or was it? No. Was there a time when you looked at it and said, <laughs> Folks, I don't think this one's worth it. No, I mean, we always were very uh, uh, looking forward to how to put this building back together. There were definitely surprises, especially like when we found um, six feet of ice built up on top of one of the, the vault structure in the waiting room. Uh, we, we wondered what had that done over the past 30 years of that much weather and, and water infiltration to these architectural systems. Could it withstand us drying it out and putting new systems into this building. But we were hopeful and, and had a great team of, of people to rely on and, and pull in expertise to really figure out the best way to tackle this project. So architect Winbowski, um, how is it that, you, how do you approach something like that? How do you, how do you bite it off? What do you say, we're gonna start with this and we'll work our way to that? and what were some of the surprises that you found? Absolutely, it's really that kind of hands-on, get your, you know, get in there and get dirty and understand what the building is telling you. We spent countless days and months on site just surveying and understanding what was there, what was still left, um, uh, and, and bringing in those experts, uh, our material conservationists, Jablonski Conservation, um, our structural engineers with Silman, and even our, our engineers uh, to come in to understand how to put these things back together. We looked for all those artifacts that were still there that we could better understand uh, what, really, what that place really felt like back in the 19 teens. You were able to save a lot of the tiles, a lot of the bricks, and to also tell us about the limestone challenge. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So this building is covered with uh, limestone cladding at the base of the building, and um, we were actually able to find the source of the original quarried limestone out of, uh, out of Indiana. And we luckily, they had archives that showed exactly where they had extracted the stone out of the, uh, out of the quarry, and that they had pulled stone, extra stone, at the same time. But the business was no longer It wasn't open anymore. Uh, there, but you opened it back up. Exactly, <laughs> yes. And it was wonderful to be able to have that exact piece of stone to go back into this building. It really helps pulling everything together when we're trying to match the old and the new stone together. How much of today's technology played a role in doing the scanning or whatever you had to do to be able to say, this is what we have, this is... S salvageable yeah. and this is not. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, uh, we used a lot of technology to scan the details to be able to create like a 3D model of them so that they could be uh, like lasers, a laser cut um, using more tech, uh, more uh, modern uh, machines to replicate those materials. But we also had to rely on craftsmen as well. There's a lot of still hands-on carving that went into the recreation of these materials. And sometimes we would pair that kind of old school craftsman style of approach with the new technology where we would start off with uh, the with uh, uh, carving of the stone or, or molding of the plaster and then scan it and replicate it. Was it I understand that close to 3,000 some odd uh, people were involved in this process, all different types of professionals, engineers, architects, you name it, um, skilled trades people. How difficult was it to find the people that could work on these projects who knew and understood these type of buildings that were built over 100 years ago? We, uh, w luckily we had a great partner with Crispin Brinker, uh, the construction manager on the project, and we and them and uh, with Ford came up with ideas of how to right size different packages of the construction so we could pair national expertise with local tradesmen. Um, for instance, for the Guastavino vault system in the waiting room, we were able to pull in uh, expert knowledge from uh, Graciano who had done repairs in New York City where a lot of Guastavino vaults are. And, and they came and actually did a whole workshop and training session with the local uh, Mason, uh, Masons. And that way we could teach that new knowledge and new repair technologies to our craftsmen here. Wow, so there's a learning process involved as well. All right, we're gonna take a quick little pause for the calls. We'll come right back. I wanna to talk to you about uh, kind of the bigger picture of architecture and why it's so important to save these buildings. And also a little tease about people bringing things back to that <laughs> building. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to Spotlight, talking to Angela Y. Rimbelski. She is the senior associate at Quinn Evans Architectural Firm. They have offices in Detroit and Ann Arbor. All right, I read something about once this process started and people could tell they're really going to restore this historic building that had been sitting there for umpteen number of decades that people started bringing stuff back. <laughs> oh, some of this almost sounded like mystery movie stuff. Is that true? <laughs> they did, yes. We received several artifacts from people who had been safekeeping them for since the, the, you know, the train station For lack closed. of a better word. Yes, right? yes, exactly. <laughs> um, from the clock that goes on the carriage house um, to, to stone pieces that are, were part of the waiting room to even small pieces that came off of the the clock in the ticket lobby and the chandeliers. Uh -huh. All of those different things helped us recreate what was missing. And you just get calls and say, hey, I'm gonna yeah. leave such, <laughs> exactly. I'm gonna leave it here and you'd go and it was there. Yes, yeah, yeah. some no, of our no, jobs. No questions <laughs> asked, yeah. no questions asked. All right, let me ask you because uh, you're well-educated, bachelor's from the University of Michigan, your master's in architecture from the Boston Architectural College. Um, you're working for a firm that their specialty is historic preservation and taking existing buildings. And it was started by two University of Michigan architectural school graduates um, who were men, yes. but, but the firm is now owned by women? It's a women-owned business, yes. Yep. All right, very good. You said a couple of things, because uh, I want you to talk about the importance of wh why we should restore buildings that we can save, okay? Um, one, you said the greenest building is the one that is already built. And so that gets into some of our, uh, our environmental stuff. Um, and then one of your colleagues said something to the effect of, he said, if we do the building right, it has an arc that lasts much longer. What's more important is preserving the cultural attributes of the building. Um, talk about that in adaptable reuse, which you guys, you say a lot in yes, the architecture yes. world. We, we use the term adaptive reuse a lot when we're talking about giving buildings a new life. Um, so much of our communities and our neighborhoods are built up around the, you know, the architecture. Uh, 
our, our identity and our civic pride is really tied closely to architecture, even if we don't, you know, you know, recognize it on a day-to-day -day basis. And so um, our, our, our mantra of, you know, the greenest building is the one that's already built or uh, is really about uh, recognizing that buildings hold a lot of not only embodied energy and carbon, but also value to the community members. Um, and, and, and people seeing those buildings being brought back to life kind of enlivens them and, and makes them feel like their, their neighborhood is, is, is worth, uh, worth saving and worth uh, uh, making better. When you saw that old building, what did you have to do to say, okay, it's an old building, but we can also take today's environmental technology um, and things that we're concerned about and adapt it to the building. Was that the example of the skylight? No part of what happened? Sure. Uh, th uh, from how we deal with the envelope of the building to help retain uh, heat and cooling, um, so that you know you're not expelling all that energy out of the envelope, to um, the mechanical systems efficiency, uh, to even stormwater capture. All of those different things that go into modern buildings help uh, the environment around it. Okay. Um, this is not the first time you've done this. Uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about yourself and your specialty, your expertise here, and other projects that you've worked on that I guess helped prepare you for this big <laughs> one you had to deal with. Yes, I've been lucky to work on some amazing buildings here in Detroit and in Michigan um, uh, with Quinn Evans. We most recently were working on the Metropolitan Building and the Wurlitzer Building in Detroit that have turned into the Element and Siren hotels respectively. Uh, those, both of those buildings again were abandoned for over 30 years and have now uh, have, have a new life and uh, a new use. Um, I've been able to work on the Old Wayne County Building, the Masonic Temple, um, and, even, and even projects uh, throughout the the rest of, of Detroit. Uh, that, I think a municipal building in Ann Arbor. Yes, the Ann Arbor Municipal Building. Uh, that was, you know, they took the old 60s uh, office tower and and revived it and added a new courthouse to it. Mm -hmm. um, you, yeah. You've done some stuff in Buffalo and also on the East Coast? I have, yes. Yeah. So right now I'm actually working on the Buffalo Central Terminal. It's very similar to Michigan Central. It uh, uh, was it's a more of an Art Deco style uh, train station, also abandoned though for 40 years. And we're trying to take what we've learned here at Michigan Central and, and, and seeing what we can apply in Buffalo to give that building another, another chance. All right, great, all right, we need to take another little break here. We come back, I wanna talk about this big award that you recently won. We'll be right back. You recently, you being the firm that you work for, uh, a big award from AIA, and it was called the Architecture Firm Award for 2024. Um, that's a big kudos, and normally I guess it's not given for historical old buildings type of thing. It's more of these new structures <laughs> that, that get all the recognition. Yeah, we were... This uh, is a national award. It's a national award. Uh, it's been a very momentous uh, past week. Uh, the firm celebrated our 40th anniversary. We were uh, accepted this, the, the AIA Firm Award and with Michigan Central's grand opening. It was quite the week. But uh, yes, the AIA uh, acknowledges one firm each year that kind of exemplifies the profession and where the profession's going, both uh, acknowledging their design, innovation, and expertise, but also their commitment to environmental stewardship. And it's great, and you're right here in our own backyard. Um, talk a little bit about, uh, one, how this probably made the Ford Motor Company and Bill Ford and his vision feel uh, for you to win this type of award, and the relationship that you had with Ford, um, would this have been possible without that big company behind you and the branding of that company and their vision and their money. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. A big project like this does take a lot of funds. Um, but it also, the building would have never been able to be saved by Ford if it wasn't originally saved by the grassroots effort to, to stop the demolition back in 2009. Good point. So, 
uh, we, it's amazing what uh, the, the Ford family came to the table and, and wanted to do with this property. They saw the vision, they acted on it, and, and, and wanted to do it uh, quickly. <laughs> and thank goodness, because I feel like any, uh, if we would have started the project any later, uh, there would have been a lot less to save. Yeah, absolutely. You referenced earlier that the firm is now owned by women. Talk briefly about um, women in architecture today. I know when you got this award, uh, I think one of your colleagues, Sarah Timberlake, um, who does more of the green side of all of this, uh, was also acknowledged with you and other members of the firm. Um, what are we going to see from women in architecture? <laughs> are they finally getting their due? <laughs> We've always been there, uh, but we are being very uh, in, recognized more. Um, we are holding more leadership roles. Um, we and, and I and I contribute that to being people being more open with how we work nowadays. There's a more emphasis on life work balance, and so being a mom and being you know involved with other things outside of work, you can still do that and excel in the profession. Yeah. Detroit's history in terms of uh, architecture and historic preservation. Uh, do we have a a rich source to work from? Oh, we do. We are so lucky to have such amazing historic examples uh, in, within our city from, you know, the turn of the century, Beaux-Arts style, uh, like the Michigan Central, to even modern structures. We have, we're, we are lucky to have Yamasaki and, uh, and other modern architects uh, who have also uh, touched the city with their, with their designs. But even our residential neighborhoods have gems. Uh, think of all the, uh, with Puabic Tiles, Start, starting here in Detroit, even just local little tiny homes have these little special gems and nuggets inside that really speak to how people uh, really valued their home and their neighborhood. Take me back to Michigan Central for a moment. I think I read something to the fact that if you look in certain places, there's maybe still even some graffiti in some places. There is. And why was it important? for you to make sure that that stayed. Yeah, Michigan Central isn't just the train station that opened in 1913. Michigan Central is the whole, kind of embodies the whole life of the city of Detroit. Um, and, and it symbolizes a lot to the city of how uh, our, our, our innovation and, and, and ingenuity uh, could surpass even you know, hard times. And so it was important for us to leave, leave a little bit of a nod to the kind of the hard times that the building had to go through and acknowledge that uh, without, without that kind of use of the building ad hoc where people were having parties and raves and, and other things uh, that people wouldn't have that special connection to a place then in, and it wouldn't have been saved. Yeah. Is restoring existing building, is it good economics? Because this building is not restored just for what it originally was for. It is now supposed to serve something bigger, this 30-acre mobility uh, campus and this look towards the future of where we're going in terms of mobility. But is it good economics? Absolutely. I mean, th thinking about even just what it what it means to the neighborhood, that already uh, people are being drawn to it, um, and, and it's uh, setting it up for its next generation, its next hundred years. Having a staple like that that uh, really grounds and, and celebrates uh, your, your city and your neighborhood uh, draws new people here, new talent, and, and uh, keeps the city going. All right, I've made you talk a lot. One quick final question. You can answer it uh, very succinctly. In six years working on that building, does Angela Wyrenbelski have a favorite spot there? Oh, my favorite spot in the building. Uh, it would probably be in the waiting, the grand hall, the, the old waiting room. There is an area where the Mankato stone has uh, aged from the water damage um, over the years, but the light from the, the windows cast through and you can see the Guastavino and just the texture of it all, uh, it, it, it gives me chills even today. All right, Angela, thank you so much for coming in. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you and best of luck. Uh, on all the things that you're working on. We'll get you back to talk about some of these other yeah, stuff you absolutely. got Yeah, absolutely. Thank up. you so much. All right, thank you. And when Spotlight returns, we'll remember two Detroit legends. Stay with us.
And finally today, our condolences to the families and many, many friends of two Detroit legends, longtime Channel 7 reporter and anchor Doris Bisco and civil rights leader, pioneering businessman and generous philanthropist, Dr. Bill Picard, who we all affectionately called Doc. Rosa Parks' work is not done. 30 years ago, she had stomached all she could of segregation. 30 years later, she's still witnessing events in South Africa, communities in South Philadelphia up in arms over blacks in their neighborhoods, and cities like Dearborn saying no to, quote, outsiders in their parks. Is it a moral shame, or have we as people let Rosa Parks down? After all, she believes that all people can live together in unity. Was she asking too much 30 years ago? I think not. At the age of 72, Mrs. Parks should be able to rest, but she cannot. I'm comfortable because of Mrs. Parks. Many of our young people are comfortable because of her. But some people have forgotten her and the other key players in the civil rights movement. Most of us have never experienced hardship in a confrontational sense. But perhaps that's what makes Rosa Parks extraordinary. She understands how easily people forget as well as the simplicities of life. I met a woman who's able to live out of her handbag if she had to. A woman whose tireless giving of herself captures the essence of a virtue few of us possess. Mrs. Parks is and was a revolutionary woman. Reflecting on her actions is not meant to embarrass, instead to reawaken us. Where we're headed 30 years from now is anyone's guess. We can only hope that Rosa Parks is wrong when she says history may repeat itself. I firmly believe strongly believe that all of us have a God-given talent. And sometimes it just takes a small gesture or a friendly smile to help propel that gift into a wonderful kind of life. When I came to Detroit, 1971, like most young men and women, I had dreams, I had aspirations but I didn't have much else. And over those 50 plus years, this town embraced me, wrapped their arms around me, and literally carried me when I couldn't carry myself. And for that, I am forever, forever indebted. So I must give until it helps. They will indeed be missed. I'm Chuck Stokes. Good day.